Well, good morning, Southside. It's good to be with you. It is, I'm both honored and humbled to bring you the word this morning. It's usually a joyful event when it starts out. And then as I make my way to the church, it get, I get more and more nervous. My accent comes out, my tongue gets all tied. Um, <laughs> don't even start. I, I want you to know about your pastor. My second time preaching in our old building, I was a nervous wreck. Sitting in the front, shaking, he sends one of the deacons over and tells me, to go tell Ray, MacArthur is visiting today. <laughs> Ask his kids about him. I'm serious. <laughs> so, it is truly a delight. Um, it is a special Sunday for us, Lord's Day, as we send our, our very precious family back. Um, they came in here a year or so ago, hit the ground running, and didn't stop. I think they're more exhausted now when, than when they first came. Tanya's shaking her head. <laughs> yeah. And it is a bittersweet, as Robert said, and yet it is so appropriately beautiful that we could partake of the Lord's table together with them as we say goodbye. I want, to, I want to bring for us this morning, if you would please take your Bibles and turn with me to 3 John, the book of 1 John. I want to bring in the theme for us this morning is the centrality of the church in world mission. I pray, I pray, and I hope that the, that the spirit of the mission work would be here in our household at Southside. How we receive, how we send, how we support missionaries in a manner worthy of God himself. Somebody said, this is important, the spirit of Christ is the spirit of missions. You can't get closer to Christ without your heart getting more intense, burning for the loss of our brothers and sisters that are out there. When Christ left us on earth, he left, went to heaven. He didn't leave behind seminaries. He didn't leave behind hospitals. He didn't leave behind parachurch organization. He left behind his bride, the church, us. What Robert read for us this morning, and in John 20, 21, Jesus said to the disciples and would say to us, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. The Spirit of Christ is the Spirit of missions. And Jesus said, upon this rock I will build the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In other words, the church is on the move. We're on the move. The engine, the boiler room behind every missionary endeavor is the centrality of Christ and the church of Jesus Christ. And that's us. A sign of a healthy church is not how many seats we have, it's how many we have sent. That's a sign of a healthy church. And I really believe with all my heart, God is starting to do that here at Southside in a most precious way. So what I want to do this morning is I want to pray for us. I want to pray that we look at this biographical portion of Scripture that we hardly don't read much. And I pray that it would speak in our heart that the life and the testimony of this dear man would speak to our heart this morning. So let's go to the Lord together. Would you please bow your hearts with me this morning? Father, the goal of a preacher, Lord God, is to inform the mind 
and to affect and inflame the heart and to enable the hands. Father, that we would be disciples of both, of all head, heart, and hands, that we would love you with all our being, Lord. And so, Father, this is a task for your spirit and for your grace. So would you please, in the deepest, most profound, most endearing way, would you please, Father, would you come by your spirit and would you lay hold of our hearts and minds and effect, effect these religious affections within our heart for Christ, for one another, for your name's sake, for the worthiness of who you are, and for our brothers and sisters who will leave us. Thank you, Father. Please come. Please come, Lord, this morning and do your work in Christ's name. Look with me to 3 John. It's a small book. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respect you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. For I was very glad when brethren... When came and testified to your truth, that is, how you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers, and they have testified to your love before the church, and you will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephus, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does unjustly, accusing us with wicked words. And not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either, and and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good? The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. And we add our testimony and you know that our testimony is true. I had many things to write to you, but I am not willing to write them to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly and we will speak face to face. Peace, peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. This passage before us is probably one of the most neglected and overlooked passages in scriptures on the work of missions. And yet, it is not written to missionaries themselves. It is written to the sending churches. It is written to us. This is the story. This is our story. How we will receive, how we will support, how will we send our brothers and sisters in a manner worthy of God. And the lesson for us here from this first century church, what we would call the tale of three men, is this little book is so precious and is so full of diamonds, if you will. It is the shortest book in the whole entire Bible. It fits on one piece of paper. It's 218 Greek words altogether. It is dealing with everyday life, 
that's going on in the first and second century church, and its very effect is even to the 21st century church. It is not doctrinal. It is not theological. It's very practical. And I love these kind of books that are very practical. So we will descend from the mountaintops of Romans this morning, if you will, and look at this very practical book. It's a story behind the story is preachers, itinerant teachers, missionaries were sent from Asia Minor, modern day Western Turkey to other churches, to other places to preach the truth. They wholly depended on God and his people. They would not, as we read, would not receive money from the Gentiles, from the unbelievers. There were no parachurch organizations. There were no sending agencies, no mission boards, no support cards. There were no mission stations, no Mattels, no Ramada Inns, no Holiday Inns, none of that. And so they supported, they were supported and they relied on Small home church bodies, individuals like us who would receive them and take them in. And sometimes their hospitality came at a cost to the missionaries. It's a tale of three men. Let me make my way through the book, introduce you to these three men, and we'll come back and look at the book together. Gaius. Verse 1 is mentioned, the letter is addressed to him, it's written to him. He is this truthful, loving, faithful witness. The whole letter is really written for him, and most of it is about him. And then in verses 9 and 10, we're introduced to this, this guy, Diotrephus, Greek name. We'll nickname him Little Caesar. You'll see why. He says, I wrote something to the church but Diotrephus, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. Not only that, he accuses the apostles of wicked words. He will not even receive anyone coming from the apostles' church. And what's even worse than that is that if you decide to be hospitable to one of these itinerant preachers, he will excommunicate you out of the church. And John, you could tell within the words, he says, when I come, I'm going to call him out. I'm going to call this little Caesar out. He loves to be first. Literally, the Greek word could mean he loves to have this preeminence within the church. People like that will use ministry. They will use church and they will use people for their own end. It's a little Caesar complex. We all have that. They had their problems. We can't look back to the first century church and say, oh, the utopia. They had problems. Even hospitality, helping out, supporting gospel workers. It came at a cost. You get excommunicated for it. Then we're briefly introduced to Demetrius, verse 12. Short, Demas for short. Demetrius has received this good testimony from everyone. And from the truth itself. And we add our testimony. And you know our testimony is true. Everyone spoke well of this Demas or Demetrius. The word that they bore testimony. That we get the word martyr. People who would die for their faith. This man lived for his faith. Lived for Christ. Not just in death. But is in everyday life. And he received a good testimony from Everyone, all around him. And then verse 11 might be considered the key verse, the commanding verse, if you will, of the whole book. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God, and the one who does evil has not seen God. So the theme of this book really highlights Christian hospitality in mission support. Christian hospitality in missionary support as John unfolds Gaius as a model for us to emulate here. 
In verse 1, we're introduced to the man, Gaius. Greek, common name like James and John and Jim. Common name in the Greek. Means I am glad. I am glad. This man had John's heart. The apostle of love had this deep, real affection. Who he would always address and will address him four times. My my well-beloved Gaius, my dear friend Gaius. We don't know much about him. He wasn't marked with certain talents. He wasn't marked with certain gifts. We don't hear any role about him in the church. It just seemed this, this, this ordinary yet extraordinary man that functioned in the body, him and his family. Verse 1 The apostle opens up with greeting and salutation to him. He calls himself the elder. John is probably in his 90s. And he says, to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth, or or it could be translated, whom I love truly, because the truth has bound these men together. In verse 2 comes the greatest salutation or the greatest compliment a man can receive. Listen to this. Beloved, I pray that in all respect you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prosper. Here is an insight into this man's spiritual richness. I'm not sure if Gaius had some sort of a physical ailment or He wasn't cutting it. His health was bad. He was poor. We we don't know. Some some of this hints toward that. But what, what John is saying here is he says, I hope your material and your physical health prospers and catches up to your spiritual help. Isn't that something? His spiritual stamina was so robust it somehow, it was outpacing his physical and material circumstances. So unlike today. Inwardly, there is this spiritual richness inwardly about this man and outwardly that, that John the Apostle says, I hope, I pray through and through your life, your goodwill, health, Materials, everything prosper the way your soul is prospering, Gaius. What a compliment. He's wishing him all the best. If you like outlines, here they are. Three commands or three commendation, three motives and one command in this book. Three commendation, three motives and one command. We'll go through those very quick. Verse 3, first commendation, witness to his walking in the truth. For I was very glad, I was very glad when the brethren came, and the Greek here is the brethren kept coming to the apostles' church, and they kept coming, and they kept coming, one after one, group after group. They kept coming, and they kept coming, and testifying to your truth. That is how you're walking in the truth. His, his life, his testimony has gone public. And he said, people kept coming and telling me about this. He's the real deal. Hey, John, he, Gaius is the real deal. There is no disconnect between his head and his heart and his hands. His household, his, his, his home, his family followed through. He's through and through genuine. Truth was personified in this man's life and family, especially in his hospitality to the saints. There's this wholeness and completeness about him. Everything was all engaged in his life. Verse 4, listen to this. Literally in the Greek, it goes like this. Greater joy I have none other than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. John pins this down. 
he emphasizes greater joy, puts it right at the beginning of the sentence, right at the beginning of the verse. And he says, I have greater joy. I have none like this to know my children are walking in the truth. How gorgeous. How gorgeous is that? I was very glad and I have no greater joy but to hear my brothers and sisters walking in the truth. The Hebrew word walking it's, is an idiom, if you will. It's how you live out life. It's fidelity to the truth. Your doctrine and your life are synced together. There is this aim about this man's life. There is no disconnect. He, be- he believes and he behaves the same way. What was it? What was it? Second commendation. His faithfulness to hospitality. Look at verse 5. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers. He was taking people in that he does not even know about. He's giving them his house keys. He's opening up his family. He's opening up his heart. He's opening up his home. He's opening up to people he doesn't even know. It's easy to do that to our favorite people, to people we we like, people we feel safe with. Gospel hospitality is rooted and grounded and grounded in God. It's a spiritual and a divine reception. Our home, our homes become gospel embassies, spiritual hospital, a refreshing station, safe havens to weary and saints, and especially when they're gospel workers for physical, for emotional, for spiritual rest and encouragement to them. When weary saints who've been on the road, and especially when they're strangers and they're unknown to us, opened up his heart. And, and he says, in whatever, in whatever you accomplish means an unspecified number of ways Different, multiple, on multiple occasions, big or small, once or a hundred times, he cared for these strangers. He was all out. Hebrews 13, 1, we know this passage. Let love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Philoxenia is the word. Love of strangers. How's your loving How's your loving for strangers doing today? Do you love strangers? Do you love them enough to bring them in? Lovers of strangers to care for them. We do it with spiritual zeal, with the hotness of our heart, fervent love, not lagging behind, not grumbling, but with a special care. Listen, earthly homes reflect heavenly hospitality. Our earthly homes ought to reflect heavenly hospitality. Being a hospitable person is a state of your heart, not of your home. It's a state of your heart. We don't say do hospitality. We say be hospitable. It's your heart. It's your being. It's your being. In the Middle East, it's a very common practice. When you sit, whether at home or at a restaurant, with an Arab who's hosting you, or a Middle Eastern who's hosting you, and everybody gets their plates, they will not take a single bite from their plate until they have offered every single plate to the guest person. They will not take a single, here, try this, here, try this, here, try this, eat, eat. That's why we look the way we look. (laughs) God, God didn't trickle down 
his love and his grace on us. He lavished us. Ephesians 1, he lavished us. So we could lavish one another with, his, with love, with generosity, with hospitality. Care for strangers as God cared for you. Especially, especially when they're workers of the gospel. Especially those. Third commendation, his witness to his, the witness to his love. Listen, look at verse 6. Not only did they testify about he walking in the truth and faithfulness, but they have testified to your love. Originally it was to your truth earlier, and now he says they're testifying to your love before the church. And he says, you will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. His hospitality, his kind generosity had gone public, and he held the truth in, in the palm of his hand. The truth was sort of palmed through this generosity, if you will. He held the truth in love, and he showed it through his home, through his family, whether it's giving money or sending him with food or whatever it is, it was not just it wasn't just head, it was heart, his love, his love. There was something welcoming about him and his home. All this was on display, display through his hospitality. Nothing. Nothing is mentioned about his giftedness. Nothing is mentioned about his talent. Nothing is mentioned about how busy or how important he was or how much he was needed in in ministry. No office, no title, no seminary, no gifts, no talent. But his love and his truth through hospitality. How he refreshed the brethren. Spiritually, and physically. I love, I like guys like him. I love guys like him. Walking in the truth, serving in faithfulness, loving the brethren, mark this dear saint. And here's what's amazing about this. He gets an apostolic letter and his name is canonized in the gospel. These are the kind of men and women that carry the day. Not everyone is a Peter and a Paul and a Barnabas. But families, brothers and sisters like this man. So what's in his heart? Always look for motives. Always look for motives. What, what manner? What, what motivation? What's, what gets this guy? So there was three of them. Look at verses 6, 7, and 8. Gaius, for us, first century will affect the 21st century. John had been speaking in the past how he treated the saints when they came to his home, the gospel worker. Now he speaks in the present and he speaks in the future. So he's speaking to Gaius This is what you've done, like Paul, excel even more. And now he speaks to Gaius and for us to say, keep doing what you're doing and grow and go. So how do we do this? He says, listen, verse 6, you will do well, literally a polite request. Uh, Please, Gaius, please to send them on their way. Literally, to send to propompo, it's, it's, it's to send off. It's the idea is to walk out with them. Don't just say, bye, see you on the next furlough. It's to walk out with them, alongside them. This is a send-off. You, you, care, you, you care amply for them. Do you have enough money? You got enough food? Do you have a place to stay? Are you taken care of? This is the kind of sending off that we do. We've been doing it well here. Worthy. Worthy. 
how do you send someone off worthy of God? I don't want to mess with this verse, but how do you send someone? How do you, how do you receive Jesus Christ, support him, and send him out? How would you do that? He says, do that to the people who are visiting you. Gospel workers. The word worthy, appropriate, even. It's a scale term. It's not like this. It's not like this. It's like this. Appropriate, worthy. Send them off in a manner worthy of God. Equal. One man put it, it was perhaps more important to remind the churches not to treat missionaries like beggars and so bring discredit to the name of God whom they were looking for their support. It has to do about our witness. Let me add one more thing here because this happens in the church today. Praise God, not here. Alpha 6 family, the Deckards, Shannon and Lydia, they're not our employees. They're not employees of the church. They're family who went out being called by God. This is not their career. This is their calling in life. Second motivation, look at verse 7. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentile. They said no to the unbelieving world. This is gospel work that they may be beheld and underpinned and, under and supported to the believing world. They went out for his name's sake. God's name God's name is God's revelation of himself. It's not a career that calls them. It's not they're trying to find themselves. It's not trying to find purpose in life. But it's the person of God who calls them out to the mission field. And they answered the call with their life. And it is the name of of God who is calling, is calling them. Let me go one more negative on us today. Any, any mission or missionary endeavor that does not go out for the sake of his name, absent of the gospel proclamation and the gospel discipleship, is not a Christian mission. We go out for his name's sake. His name. Why? There is, there is salvation in no, other, in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Why would a family of 11 at the time leave their home, leave their country, leave their church, leave their family, leave their safety, leave their comfort, leave their career, and move to a neighborhood and a region that is a hotbed of ISIS recruits. Why would they do that? To find themselves? To have a purpose in life? It's the name that has called them. And here, we affirm that with them. And we will go all out with them. So we might ask, what's in the name? The very deity, the person of Jesus Christ. It's the Godhood of God that is in the name. That God in Philippians 2, God bestowed on him the name which is above every name. That the person of the name that is that's called them, and they went out in obedience to the world. The world doesn't understand this, but we do. 
So the proclamation of the name begins, begins, and began in the first century and continues today. I asked Nick about this a couple of weeks ago. He said, time fails me to consider the impact of Southside on God's work here in Tijuana, Mexico. Sometimes it is easy as missionaries to worship the idea of missions more than God with whom we are to proclaim. This was a pitfall of mine many, many times over, which is why I am convinced that we desperately need to be immersed and invested fully and completely in the body of believers that will point us to Jesus Christ, who is our head. They went out for his name sake. Such high, holy calling. Take that very seriously. Third motivation. Therefore, verse 8, the conclusion, he says, we ought to. There's this sense of obligation. John is telling Gaius, we, 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 we ought to. This is how we're to act. This is, this is, an, this is an not if you'd like to do support this people, Gaius, Gaius is telling, John is telling Gaius, Gaius, we, we're under obligation. We're under obligation because they went out for his name's sake, receiving nothing. We ought to support. Literally, some of your translation, help or receive such people. And here's the purpose clause. So that... We don't become supporters, but we become soon ergos, double word, fellow co-workers, co-laborers with the truth. This isn't about supporting missionaries. This is about co-missionaries or co-helping or co-fellowshipping in their cause. We don't just sign checks. Keep doing that. Don't get me wrong. Keep doing that. But we receive, we host, we train, we we send for the purpose of sharing with them. Example of this is in Romans 16. I commend to you Sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is in St. Crea that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her, help her in whatever matter she might need of you. For she herself has been also a helper for many, and of myself as well. You know what Paul is telling the Romans? Don't spare any expense. Help this sister of ours, in whatever she might need, don't get cheap on the saints, even when they're strangers to you. Don't go frugal on them. Go frugal on yourself so you could be frivolous on them. One more example. Look at the phrase, fellow workers, Philippians 1. Philippians 1, 3. You could turn there if you want. He says, the phrase fellow workers in the truth, they they share with me, they're partners with them. He says, I thank in Philippians 1, 3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. I, I can't stop giving thanks when I think of you. Always offering prayer with joy and in my every prayer of you all. Why? In view of your participation, literally the koinonia, the, that, that how you fellowshiped with me in the gospel from the first day till now. For I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. There's, by the way, a debate over this verse, whether it's about the preservation of the saints or really it's about missionary endeavor of the Philippians with Paul. We won't work that out here today, but 
But look at the very next verse. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and in my defense and in my confirmation of the gospel, you all partook of the grace with me. William Carey, we all know that famous quote. I am going down into the pit. You hold the ropes They that hold the ropes and the daring miners that swing away down in darkness are one in work, maybe one in the motive, and if they are, shall be one in rewards. If I can use a business term, as fellow workers, as people who participate in the gospel with our missionary brothers and sisters, we're not the silent partners. We're not the silent partners and we just let someone else do the work. We hold the rope. We encourage. We send cards. We pray for them. We beg God, give us the world. That's what we do as a church. We're not silent partners. Just write a check. Go away. Did my thing. Co-labors. Philippians 4, 14 and 17. Nevertheless... Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourself also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even Thessalonica, you sent me gift more than once. Again, we're not supporters. We're fellow workers. We're fellow workers. And here at Southside, we've been doing well, and we need to grow. We've been doing well. When God calls one of us, he calls us all. In our own home here, is Nick writing again. He said, having been sent out to Mexico, the continual outpouring of love, accountability, and prayer has been truly humbling. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 8 that the Macedonians begged him with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. This has been our experience in Mexico, and not just financially, but also through many Ephroditus who have demonstrated real servant love to come down here and to minister to us and to minister with us. We have experienced through the constant flow of cards, letters, calls, texts, care package. Perhaps the greatest encouragement comes in a form of prayers. When you know you have a body praying for you, for your family, for the work, for the Holy Spirit among the people and Tijuana, there is a great encouragement and there is a great boldness and peace in that work at hand. The prayers of the saint, we believe, will carry us in Mexico. The Alpha 6 family, they came back to watch family after family. You need a van, here's a van. You need a car, here's a car. You need a home, here's a home. You need extra finances. Here's extra finances. You need meals. You need cards. What do you need? The father tells me, he says, "Uh, it's surreal. It's unbelievable. He gloats on the mission field to other missionaries. They tell him, who sent you? He says, no agency. My people. My people sent me. My church. Everybody feeling a sense of loneliness out there. But to have a body. Your love, we call them the Tijuana too. Lydia and Shannon. Again, who would leave the comfort of their home church, the career, the safety, the family, the friends. Move as co-laborers, supporters of a new church, doing work babysitting, doing whatever it takes, and yet you're welcomed by gunshots and a dead body in front of your home in the first two weeks. 
Who does that? They went out for his name's sake. And God is starting to do some beautiful things at Southside here. Unlike any year I have ever seen. One person said one of the most amazing moments in church histories were made possible by generous friends behind the scenes. William Tyndale's Bible translation, William Carey's missionary journey, George Mueller's orphanage, Brother Andrew's Bible smuggling, all of them, all of them were brought about by concentrated friendship born of generosity and opened, open-handed faith. Such is the God we serve that when he wants to build a temple, he doesn't wave a wand, but steers the hearts of his children to, gen- to be generous and joyful givers. When he wants to reach a nation, he rarely sends a company of glorious angels. Instead, he sends a team of fallible humans. And when he wants to use an individual, he rarely chooses the most gifted, but the most ordinary, propped up by the quiet prayers and tangible love of their friends and family. Back to, first John, to John 3, Third John. Beloved, here's a key verse application for us. I need to wrap this up. Do not imitate, do not imitate what is evil, but good, do good. The one who does good is of God. And the one who does evil has not seen God. Keeping within the context How's your hospitality? How's your hospitality to strangers? How's your love for the saint? Did they come to your home and get renewed and refreshed? How's the church family? How we receive people? How we host them? Let me get one practical way for us. We could do this. We've come short of it. Children of missionary, of missionaries sometimes suffer the most. They're ripped out of their own homeland. They're put in a different culture. They don't speak the language. Parents, the tension, do I send my kids to, to the nation's school? Do they go and study of Islam? Did I keep them home when they graduate and they li- they're living thousands of miles away? If these missionaries are truly, truly our brothers and sisters, we love them. Then by nature we inherited spiritual nephews and nieces. I love these kids. Conversation with, with Nick a couple of weeks ago. I asked about Hudson. He said, pray for Hudson. He's struggling. He's struggling. It's beautiful when, when the Alpha 6 daughters come up and they hug you and, you and you kiss them on their forehead and they call you Ammo, which is uncle, spiritual uncle. How about we be spiritual aunts and uncles to them? How about we take care of them? Don't kiss the boys, they'll slap you. (laughs) Jesus commanded his church, ask the Lord for the harvest, the Lord of the harvest, to send workers into the harvest field. Right here, right here, is where faithful missionaries are made. They went far, and they went out. They picked up their cross. My first encouragement and exhortation to you this morning, don't drop your cross because you're in the home church. Don't drop your cross. Don't make life about yourself. Don't get comfortable. Don't be a little Caesar, okay? Don't drop your cross. Stay focused. Stay alert. Two, about a month ago, 
my wife and I had dinner with a man that was working for Saddam Hussein, and he told us about his testimony. And he said he was a former Muslim, became a believer, and we're going to, during the mission conference, we're going to FaceTime with him and get, and get to know him a little better. But he told me a story. He said he's, he's centered in Europe right now. He said, Ray, a well-known Iraqi pastor got arrested in Iraq and was thrown into the pit of prison with all these ISIS members. He said, I got called by the White House. I got flown to the White House to negotiate with the Iraqis for his release. His family somehow knew some senators and congressmen and all these guys. So they worked a deal out with the Iraqi government that this friend of mine of ours here, we'll call him James for his name here for a minute for security. He said, I went down to Iraq I went to the police station, and as I saw this man walk out of prison, he looked at him and he said, James, please don't tell me you're here to get me out. I'm not coming. He said, there are so many ISIS members here who will never hear the gospel. This is the one opportunity I have. Go home. Stay focused. This man said, I did not know what to tell his wife. I almost lied to her. Don't drop your cross. Be intentional. Stay alert. Stay alert. Finally, don't lose your heart. Don't lose your heart by losing your first love for Christ. Don't get busy. We have so much muchness, homes and cars and kids and hobbies and careers and all these things. Don't get busy and get drowsy. Don't get drowsy spiritually. As I said, the spirit of Christ is the spirit of mission. The closer we get to Christ, the more intense our heart will beat for the unbelieving world. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Lord God, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the life 2,000 years ago. Gaius, ordinary man, yet not so ordinary. Truthful, faithful loving, motivated by the name of Christ. Father, would you please raise many, many Mr. and Mrs. Gaius's here. Would you please raise them, Lord, for us. And Father, this morning we pray as we say goodbye to our dear, dear, closer than a brother, family. Father, would you please grant travel mercies with them. Lord, and as we partake of your table this morning, Lord, together as a family, Lord, would you meet us in a very, very special way. Please, Lord, we pray. In Christ's name we ask.